Well, uh, welcome everybody to the second uh, OUP Investment Claims uh, Summer Academy. Uh, we're here uh, today to uh, meet with uh, the author, uh, one of the authors of uh, the second edition of International Investment Arbitration, uh, Substantive Principles. Uh, I've got a copy right here so everyone can know that. And our author today is uh, Matthew Weininger. Uh, Matthew is a partner at uh, Linklater uh, since 2015. Uh, congratulations, he's now a Queen's Council. One of uh, a number of the arbitration community, uh, so it helps definitely increase the profile and, uh, and uh, uh, demonstrates the importance of arbitration, in, uh, certainly in the, uh, the UK world. Uh, uh, Matthew is a Cambridge grad, which uh, I, I, I think that's a wonderful thing, even though we're sitting here in Oxford, uh, the other the other <laughs> place. Uh, I think we're, we're allowed to say that word, aren't we, Cambridge? Yes. <laughs> uh, I should mention the other authors uh, to the book uh, who are not here today are Campbell McLaughlin, QC, as well as uh, Lawrence Shore. Um, um, they, they are the dynamic trio. Uh, having produced uh, originally uh, this book, I believe in 2007 was the, the first edition, they have uh, taken uh, I guess now seven, eight years uh, of experience and uh, come out with a second edition. And uh, Freddie, in his opening remarks, uh, mentioned that we'll also be looking at uh, Antonio Perez's uh, second edition of his book, The History of Exit, later on in the conference. And it really brings kind of a theme to our discussion uh, with Matthew, which is the uh, end of, of the Summer Academy of, of sort of second editions, of second iterations. and. Uh, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, this second edition of International Investment Arbitration is really uh, an embodiment of uh, what uh, Todd Weiler and I saw as kind of the future uh, for these types of works. Uh, in investment claims, uh, we have not we have the full version uh, of the book available uh, digitally, and, and it's uh, fully hyperlinked to all the cases and materials cited in the in the book. So it's an incredibly useful resource. Uh, folks can go to the book, they can see the cases, they can go directly and read the cases for themselves. So it provides that kind of uh, access to the primary sources that, that we hoped would, would happen when we uh, created investment claims uh, you know, over 10 years ago. So uh, let's get to the promotion of the book, because that's what we're here to talk about. And I just, going through the new book, you have, uh, Matthew, you have a, an interesting quote right at the beginning in your preface, and uh, this is a quote from uh, Herschel Auerbach's 1933 book, The Function of Law uh, in the International Community. And, and let me read this quote, and then I'll ask for your, your comments. Uh, Lauterbach says, the reign of law, represented by the incorporation of obligatory arbitration, as a rule of positive international law is not the only means for securing and preserving peace among nations. Nevertheless, it is an essential condition of peace. Now that's a pretty dramatic statement for Hirsch to be making. And let me remind you that the context uh, of the world uh, uh, when he made that statement, this was 1933, um, a bit of a tenuous time, as you know, a new authoritarian leader came into power in 1933 in Germany. Uh, the world was suffering from the aftermath, continuing to suffer from the aftermath of, of the Great War, World War I. Um, we also saw a great growth in international arbitration in the previous 20 years, uh, following from the PCA in, in 18, uh, I guess it was 1899, the formation of the PCA and then the formation of the PCIJ in the 1920s along with the League of Nations, arbitration really was seen as kind of this answer to many of the world's problems. And then we come to today's context, another world where you could uh, perhaps observe there's some authoritarian tendencies and in certain international leaders, uh, and a rejection of the reign of law in favor of rule of power. Uh, we can see some very stark examples in, in the current atmosphere. And, and I was just wondering, when you, when, uh, Matthew, when you uh, inserted this quote, 
were you intending on being so appointed, or was this just a happenstance that occurred uh, when the book came out this year, and that we find ourselves in this uh, strange new, new world uh, in which uh, rule of law and rule of power are, are at loggerheads? I think it's actually a mixture of both, because the, the quote stands on its own, both as a, as a historical guidance to the mindset of international lawyers in the 1930s, but it does have resonance to what we're talking about today. Um, although it doesn't fully apply, it's a good way to start the book, but by the end of the book, that's not exactly the mindset, because what Lautzpacht is talking about there is state-to-state -state arbitration, and putting rules into a, an environment that previously was not policed by rules and the issues of, of sovereignty. The issues change, they don't do any less pressing, but they do change in less state arbitration. Because although the rules are set up by states, the users of the rules um, are, the, uh, are either individuals or corporations, but in any event, private actors. So the idea that private actors can enforce rules against states on the international plane, that is going even further beyond um, where Lautapath is, is, is heading. And, um, and even though the idea of Lautapath saying that states have to renounce a bit of their sovereignty is controversial enough, as we've seen from the debates around the subject um, nowadays, the idea that they have to renounce their sovereignty in favour of private actors is, is even more controversial. Well, and this, this idea of uh, some renunciation or diminution of uh, sovereignty obviously is a real uh, sensitive, a very sensitive point in investment arbitration because that's ultimately what investment arbitration is about. States uh, voluntarily uh, agree to be subject to obligations which uh, allow a form of review, effectively, of, of their conduct, which um, when the rubber hits the road and cases actually occur, um, this uh, creates a great deal of controversy. So how do you see that uh, fitting into kind of the, the current debates we're seeing about investment arbitration? Well, uh, the controversy depends on, <clears throat> on which countries are entering into these agreements. I mean, the, the, the growth of investment arbitration it started, you know, as, as everybody here knows, as, as long back as the 50s, it really took off in the 90s. Um, and thousands of treaties allowing for investor state arbitration were signed and used. It didn't really become controversial in public life until the TTIP negotiations and the idea of the EU and the US including such a provision um, became so scandalous to public opinion in Europe. And, and obviously a, a, a large number of, of op-eds and um, civic society competition was generated. TTIP is, is paused, to put it mildly, um, for now, but the EU, where civil society really first showed, showed its opposition to this, is continuing to negotiate agreements with investor state provisions um, around the world. Today's news is um, a, an agreement with Japan is being agreed in principle, and um, investor state arbitration is on the table there. Civil society is very muted in the response, so it's only really when the US is involved that, that, that people are complaining. Well, and, and it's interesting you, you raised TTIP, but from a European viewpoint, that was the kind of turning point in terms of the um, of investment arbitration becoming kind of an issue in, in terms of it being a contentious issue. In, in the North American context, where, where I hail from, um, we had very similar debates in the you know, late 1990s. Uh, over the uh, multilateral agreement on investment with the OECD and NAFTA, of course. There was a great deal of uh, crit critiques, not, not unlike the TTIP critiques. Um, where do you see all that going? We have this kind of historical trend from the NAFTA to TTIP to TPP as well. Now we see uh, uh, Donald Trump and, and his administration, and the, out of the gates they reject the TPP. Granted, I don't think the reason was mainly with regard to investment arbitration, but we have ourselves in the middle of an after negotiation. Uh, do, you, do you have any insights as to where that might go, at least on the investment side? Well, let's just start with your final word in the question, which I think is where the key is, because it's the, it's the, the elephant that hasn't previously been in the, room, in the room. You finish your question by saying, at least on the investment side. But what has happened is that, certainly in Europe, investment arbitration has grown up. <clears throat> it's really a parallel system with no connection to trade. 
which as a system of law makes sense, but as an economic system, it's not the, the distinction isn't necessarily so logical. And what has happened is that trade and investment at the treaty making um, sphere have been pushed together. And one, uh, and they're both subject to, or each of them are subject to different pressures. And the question certainly for the EU and after Brexit for the UK as well will be whether to continue negotiating trade and investment together, which will mean that each will suffer from the other's weaknesses, or whether to separate them out again and put them back on parallel tracks that barely, that, that, that barely interact. And then maybe the, 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 <clears throat> the, the clamour will die down. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic, and I know, having spoken to certain people negotiating from the EU at the moment, um, that the EU has specific reasons for wanting to keep investment and trade together. Firstly, they have this evangelical view that um, they have worked out a solution to the difficulties of investment arbitration. We'll, we'll get on to that and we'll have a very happy to discuss it and we'll have a great discussion here. But the other view is that if you are the EU um, negotiating a trade treaty, chances are the, I mean, Japan um, accepted that everybody else you negotiate with will be a smaller economic power than the EU. So the EU isn't necessarily looking for access to their market, but what they are looking for is investment protection. So if they were to divorce the two, then they are losing the strength of their hand to play negotiation. Now, now you raise it, I think I want to jump into it. Uh, the, the, the major uh, innovation, I would say, although some would say it's a, a, a return to the past, is this idea of the court, the investment court. Uh, which takes 50 years of experience from ICSID and UNCTRAL and, and the arbitration world and takes us basically into the unknown, although I think there's a great deal of comfort in the use of the word court. The uh, permanent court of international justice certainly like to use the word court, the ICJ. I mean, you, it's been seen that you throw the word court in and it creates a, 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 an aura of uh, public uh, acceptance. but. Um, we have this new court with uh, untri untried uh, um, uh, procedures. Uh, what, what's the general view about sort of where we're going on that? Well, I can't speak for the, for the, for the, for the general view, but the, the court idea is something that people within the system need to pay close attention to. Um, there are, it, it's clear from anybody practicing investment arbitration that the system is far from perfect. And if you are to compare it to, for example, judicial review in the United Kingdom or any other system of challenging a government in a developed economy, it has a number of weaknesses. The cost, the length, the uncertainty, and that's putting aside any questions of political legitimacy, uh, which happens anyway when judges rule against, rule against governments. Whether or not, however, this is the correct answer to the difficulties that everyone has to admit exist it, it, it is a separate thing. And I like to start from first principles. And to me, the, the first principle issue with a court is who's going to pay for it. If you're a state, the great advantage of arbitration is that um, you only need to pay for an arbitration if you're directly involved. Otherwise, there's no need. And in an era of tight public budgets, that's a great attraction. I remember hearing somebody recently talking about discussion between the EU and uh, an Asian country, <clears throat> which very rarely features in. Um, in investment arbitration and the Asian country said to the EU, well, hang on, you want this call? There are 15 judges. Each judge, we're told, will cost us 2,000 euros per month. We've, we've been on the receiving end of one investment arbitration in 15 years. You know, please explain why this is a good way for us to spend our money. And the EU, in selling this internationally, either has to expend a large amount of diplomatic clout that's probably better used elsewhere, or come up with a good answer to this question, um, and there currently isn't one. That, 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 that is, I think, the number one issue. The number two issue is that um, ICSID, very, ICSID is a special sort of arbitration, um, and, but it is a form of arbitration, it is a recognised form of arbitration, and it sits very well within the forms of procedure and, in particular, enforcement that have grown up around the world to support arbitration in the last 50 years. This investment court does not sit as easily with that um, legal framework, which is not a multilateral legal framework, it's a national legal framework that, um, that looks similar in most, in, in most economies around the world. 
and putting this court into national legal frameworks is going to be another challenge which I don't think we should underestimate. Well, and, and let's contrast arbitration a bit with kind of the court model. Uh, I mean, arbitration has certain benefits, uh, finality being one, efficiency, hopefully, but not in all cases. Um, courts have the advantage of uh, promoting consistency. Uh, we have in the new uh, CETA court, this is the Canada EU uh, uh, free trade agreement, uh, uh, an appeals court uh, inserted, which is in the arbitration world considered quite unusual because it goes against uh, this, this idea of finality. Um, how do you see that uh, working out once we get uh, a few appeals underway? Will that, and this, this goes into my follow-up question, will we be creating some sort of precedence, which I know has been a big issue in you know the development of investment arbitration and jurisprudence, and I'll put quotes around that, but is this going to be creating a true type of uh, 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 stare decisis almost by creating this two-level structure? I think within the court system, that's exactly why it's being put forward to create that stare decisis. And the question, will it make a difference, is, is, also, is also worth addressing because the key issue for policymakers who don't understand the nitty gritties of, 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 of the legal procedure and don't take much interest in the, in the changing contours of the MFN treatment, what they want to know is can our policy people still do what, what they want to do? So they're really looking at the flexible way in which fair and equitable treatment is developed. And, case-by-case, case, on a case-by-case case basis. Um, and there's no doubt that some of the, um, I would say, a, a limited number of awards on fair and equitable treatment, but a, a, a large number of cases that are asserted on this ground um, are not something that um, policymakers welcome if they see it as too great an infringement. Um, and that does need addressing within, within government circles at least. Um, there are two ways to address it. One is by improving the treaty drafting, and we've seen in CETA that FET is no longer three words, but it's um, close to three pages. Um, that's one way to address it, or by having a stare decisis. I actually think a better route to address this problem is, is via treaty drafting, because the problem with FET is not what is the legal definition that's actually possible to, to glean from the case law, but it's the application on a very fact-sensitive basis. Well, this leads to my follow-up question and gets us back to the book, which uh, I want to continue to uh, to promote and, and and actually dig into a little bit about um, something you said in your first edition. You, you raised uh, an issue about the common law of investment protection as sort of an emerging uh, thing. And, and you know, I, I've written about this myself in terms of how international law develops. We have our basic sources of international law of which um, you know, the custom plays a very important role. And to some extent, I think, you know, when we look at the, the EU model, it, it is kind of shifting away from that developmental model back to a more domestic, you know, as I said, stare decisis model. I just wanted to, to query with you where you think we are, we are going on that question. You said the common law of investment protection was emerging. Do you think, what, what has happened in the last seven years, the last eight years, has, has um, has that continued to be a theme, or, or, or where, where are we on that? I, it, it's definitely a theme. I mean, for me, the feature of somebody who argues these cases as a, as, a, as a practitioner, the feature of the common law is that you find a previous decision of the court, you, um, dis you analyze the basic facts that the, the judge made ruling upon, you distill the key legal principle, and then you seek to apply that in the, in, in the case that's currently being argued. And that's what common law practitioners do um, when they're in a, in a domestic legal system. And arguing these cases, exactly the same thing happens. And the, even though each tribunal is sovereign, and many tribunals um, begin their analysis of legal issues with, a, uh, with, a, with an escape clause um, provision saying, well, we are sovereign, we're not bound by the rewards, however, we're going to look at the other rewards. They, what they do is conduct a basic common law analysis. And that's no bad thing. But the reason I wanted to, I mean, my co authors will have, have their own reasons. The reason I wanted to, to write such a book was that I started, I, I was first asked to advise an investment treaty in the late 1990s. 
So I was given the treaty, actually by the client, who said this might be interesting. I remember reading the treaty and thinking, this can't mean what it says. Because this really means the government can't do this, and if the government does it, you can actually bring an arbitration. You're thinking in my head about the client, who are you to bring an arbitration against the government? But, and then I thought, well, let's, does this really happen like this? And then I looked, and though now it would take me long to look, in those days you had to look a bit further, and even the internet was, 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 was quite early. And I, so I, and, I, and, I, and I did a bit of research, and I realised that other people were doing these cases, and there'd been um, maybe one award by then, but, but there was really not that much activity. And then as the years grew on, and whenever I heard one of these cases, I printed it off and put it in the file, obviously before investmentclaims.org. Um, I, I printed it off, I, I put it in a file, and then every time you're asked to uh, apply on a new question, there are cases on all of these issues. What is an investment? What is expropriation? And to my mind, this was like a common law, and I remember thinking the most useful thing that somebody could do is take all these cases, which were starting to spill over to a second and third folder on my shelves, <laughs> and write a book, because the, 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 it, the, subject, the subject is right for that. That's how I first thought, let's write a book like this, which takes a, a, a common law approach. Campbell's approach was even more rigid. He, he obviously is involved in, in Dicey, which is, maybe the, for my mind, is, is the best English law textbook as far as clarity of exposition. But Dicey, for those who are not familiar with it, sets out the law by, by reference to rules. So it's say rule one is this is the law, and then there's a discussion of that rule. But these rules are rules written by the, by the editorial team of Dicey. And he wanted to do that in the first edition, but after some reflection, the decision was taken that the, the, the field is not necessarily right yet for that approach. And for the second edition, we, we thought about it again, but it's still not really right for um, an, author, an author team to write down what all the rules are, because the, for every rule, there are more exceptions. Now, in, in your book, you contrast this, what you could call two of the major factions, groups of folks in the investment arbitration world. I think you call them twin influences. And we have, on the one hand, the arbitration specialists, and on the other hand, the public international lawyers. And you, you see a bit of a tension there. Um, actually, part of the purpose of this academy, and I think Freddie alluded to it, is that we, we're trying to bring together those somewhat uh, contrary and perhaps uh, contentious elements of the community. Um, you observe in your book that for the specialists, the law applicable to the merits is of secondary importance to the procedure. Um, for the PIL focused practitioner, uh, you make the observation that they hold that, quote, the bit sits at the margins of the mainstream, being lex specialis, unquote. And then you go on to dive into the Diallo case, which I think clearly is a bugbear for the authors. I'm, I'm not sure if that's your personal bugbear or all three of you, but uh, you, you, you make a, a very interesting quote about the Diallo case. You say, the court held that it could not find new developments in custom from special treaty regimes in the field since the need for such re regimes could equally show the contrary. In the view of the authors of this work, the proposition is highly contestable. And for those who don't know the Diallo case, um, there have been a number of uh, authors who have written on this. Pelé gave a lecture in, uh, in 2013, the lead lecture, also bemoaning the short shrift that the ICJ has been giving uh, investment arbitration decisions, despite, as you say, that now we have over 700 decisions, all of them on investment claims uh, for our viewers and accessible for you in digital and searchable form. Uh, but uh, despite this volume uh, of incredible work by uh, the community and, and, and some fantastic arbitrators, um, we've seen very little credit given to these decisions in the development of customary international law, how we traditionally see the development of international law through these types of uh, um, uh, 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 cases, granted, um, casework is a subsidiary source viewed as one that informs the development of the other sources, but um, why do you see this as contestable? What, what, what is your problem here with, uh, with Diallo and, and that the worldview of the PIL specialist? Uh, it's great that you, that you launched on 
into this, into this question. You, and you found this quotation in the book because this actually very much reflects the mindset that, that we were in when we, when we did the first edition. I think, if I get it the chronology correct, the album came out just before the first right. edition. Right. Um, and it crystallized, or it really represented something that we had noticed in being practitioners in the field you know, in, in, in the early phase, because the time up to this first edition was really the early phase of, of, of investment arbitration, that you had the public international law specialists um, who used to say things like, they could stand up in conferences and say things like, well, the reason I chose public international law was because there are not many cases. It was an easy job. <laughs> and then and people would laugh, and that, that would be a recognisable view of public international law. But the, they, they, there was basically a number of um, grand old people who, who owned the field. And um, the, the route through was via academia. And that was the nature of public international law. And they and anything which arose out of a treaty between international between government was their bag, and nobody else was to interfere with the pristine bubble of public international law. Then, on the other hand, you had investment arbitration, where people who do arbitration generally are, are quite general. Although arbitration is to some extent its own specialism, sort of people who, who, who practice it generally have quite a generalist mindset because the cases arise across all industry sectors and you're working in a large law firm where um, you can mix up with colleagues from, from all over from all over um, the, the, all over the commercial legal world at least. The other the other the other thing is that um, US and UK law and, and English law firms are very good at developing new areas of legal practice and once they get their teeth into something they will make it look very different, much more client friendly and therefore more uh, more success and more accessibility than existed before. So they came at this from a very different mindset and they had the clients. So the public international law people had the knowledge but in fact there wasn't that much to know. And the, um, the, 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 it was the law firms that had the clients. So they are sort of new, new guys on the block, knocking on the door of, of the world of public international law, which, when I go back to the late 1990s, there were people who did public international law. Herbert Smith in those days, there was, there was Lawrence Collins, who, who ended up as a judge of the highest court in England, but he had a practice in public international law that goes back to the very beginning of his career, Barcelona Traction and all that. But that was very much a minority, a minority thing. Nowadays, this trend is, the trend started when I started in practice and is continuing to flourish, that international law is relevant for commercial entities. And so there is this great stream of knowledge and practice and desire to use the tools of international law that's flowing from the outside, from the commercial world, from the private world, into the, into the halls of academia. And that was a shock for the people who who, who been in those walls um, prior to the start of the treaty arbitration. Now it's a much better world. Um, there's much more fluidity between 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 the two groups. There's much more discussion between the two groups because you can't understand international law from an ivory tower without understanding the the, the role that individuals play in it, whether it be corporates and investment arbitration or or, or, or human beings and human rights. And you can't understand commercial law and advise in certain areas, in particular energy or government concessions, without understanding public international law. So the, the two fields have grown together. But um, in the days of Diallo, um, the, that was, I think maybe the, the, they were crashing into each other, and Diallo is the, is the remnants of the acting. <laughs> well, we, we are coming to the end of our time. Um, I, I just wanted to note that the US and Iran are back before the ICJ and currently in briefings uh, on a case uh, involving uh, the Treaty of Amity and the concept of fair and equitable treatment apparently is one of the claims being made by Iran. Um, we now have an ICJ in which uh, a number of the, uh, the, the, the court members uh, are very familiar with investment arbitration, including uh, Professor Crawford, who we know well. Um, do you think that there will be a turn from the Diallo path to one which more embraces uh, the principles, the substantive principles, and the, the type, sort of work that is included in, in your second edition? Or will we see a continued uh, path uh, to this view of, uh, of 
of investment uh, cases as lex specialis and something separate from the, the international world? I think we've moved a long way. And while at the time of the first edition, investment arbitration was the illegitimate child of international law. I think the, the time for full legitimacy and its place within the within the family tree it, it, it has arrived. And uh, I would hope that the RCJ will take the opportunity to um, put it in its, in its rightful place. Well, I guess that would be for the third edition to comment on. <laughs> there might be a new ICJ case in which to uh, provide some commentary. We, won't, we will no longer pick on Diallo, but on, uh, on this, this new case. So I just want to thank uh, Matthew Weiniger for taking the time here to talk about his new book, International Investment Arbitration, Substantive Principles. Uh, and uh, look forward to uh, even further great works from, uh, from you, perhaps the third edition in seven years. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>